Verse 20, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. A common saying has it that a letter is a dead messenger. Something is lacking in all writing. You can never be sure how the written page will affect the reader because his mood, his circumstances, his affections are so changeable. It is different with the spoken word. If it is harsh and ill-timed, it can always be remodeled. No wonder the apostle expresses the wish that he could speak to the Galatians in person. He could change his voice according to their attitude. If he saw that they were repentant, he could soften the tone of his voice. If he saw that they were stubborn, he could speak to them more earnestly. This way, he did not know how to deal with them by letter. If his epistle is too severe, it will do more damage than good. If it is too gentle, it will not correct conditions. But if he could be with them in person, he could change his voice as the occasion demanded. Verse 20, For I stand in doubt of you. I do not know how to take you. I do not know how to approach you by letter. In order to make sure that he leaves no stone unturned in his effort to recall them to the gospel of Christ, he chides, entreats, praises, and blames the Galatians, trying every way to hit the right note and tone of voice. Verse 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Here Paul would have closed his epistle because he did not know what else to say. He wishes he could see the Galatians in person and straighten out their difficulties. But he is not sure whether the Galatians have fully understood the difference between the gospel and the law. To make sure, he introduces another illustration. He knows people like illustrations and stories. He knows that Christ himself made ample use of parables. Paul is an expert at allegories. They are dangerous things. Unless a person has a thorough knowledge of Christian doctrine, he had better leave allegories alone. The allegory which Paul is about to bring is taken from the book of Genesis, which he calls the Law. True, that book contains no mention of the Law. Paul simply follows the custom of the Jews, who included the first book of Moses in the collective term Law. Jesus even included the Psalms. Verses 22 and 23. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. This is Paul's allegory. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael by Hagar and Isaac by Sarah. They were both the true sons of Abraham, with this difference, that Ishmael was born after the flesh, i.e., without the commandment and promise of God, while Isaac was born according to the promise. With the permission of Sarah, Abraham took Hagar, Sarah's bondwoman, to wife. Sarah knew that God had promised to make her husband Abraham the father of a nation, and she hoped that she would be the mother of this promised nation. But with the passage of the years, her hope died out. In order that the promise of God should not be annulled by her barrenness, this holy woman resigned her right and honor to her maid. This was no easy thing for her to do. She abased herself. She thought, God is no liar. What he has promised he will perform. But perhaps God does not want me to be the mother of Abraham's posterity. Perhaps he prefers Hagar for the honor. Ishmael was thus born without a special word or promise of God, at the mere request of Sarah. God did not command Abraham to take Hagar nor did God promise to bless the coalition. It is evident that Ishmael was the son of Abraham after the flesh and not after the promise. In the ninth chapter of the epistle to the Romans, St. Paul advances the same argument which he amplifies into an allegory in writing to the Galatians. There he argues that all the children of Abraham are not the children of God. For Abraham had two kinds of children, children born of the promise, like Isaac, and other children born without the promise, as Ishmael. With this argument, Paul squelched the proud Jews who gloried that they were the children of God because they were the seed and the children of Abraham. Paul makes it clear enough that it takes more than an Abrahamic pedigree to be a child of God. To be a child of God requires faith in Christ. Verse 24, which things are an allegory? 
Allegories are not very convincing, but like pictures, they visualize a matter. If Paul had not brought in advance indisputable arguments for the righteousness of faith over against the righteousness of works, this allegory would do little good. Having first fortified his case with invincible arguments, he can afford to inject this allegory to add impressiveness and beauty to his presentation. Verses 24 and 25. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. In this allegory, Abraham represents God. Abraham had two sons, born respectively of Hagar and Sarah. The two women represent the two testaments. The Old Testament is Mount Sinai, the bondwoman, Hagar. The Arabians call Mount Sinai, Agar. It may be that the similarity of these two names gave Paul his idea for this allegory. As Hagar bore Abraham a son who was not an heir but a servant, so Sinai, the law, the allegorical Hagar, bore God a carnal and servile people of the law without promise. The law has a promise, but it is a conditional promise, depending upon whether people fulfill the law. The Jews regarded the conditional promises of the law as if they were unconditional. When the prophets foretold the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews stoned them as blasphemers of God. They never gave it any thought that there was a condition attached to the law which reads, If you keep the commandments, it shall be well with thee. Verse 25 And answereth to Jerusalem which now is, and is in bondage with her children. A little while ago Paul called Mount Sinai Hagar. He would now gladly make Jerusalem the Sarah of the New Testament, but he cannot. The earthly Jerusalem is not Sarah, but a part of Hagar. Hagar lives there in the home of the law, the temple, the priesthood, the ceremonies, and whatever else was ordained in the law at Mount Sinai. I would have been tempted to call Jerusalem Sarah, or the New Testament. I would have been pleased with this turn of the allegory. It goes to show that not everybody has the gift of allegory. Would you not think it perfectly proper to call Sinai Hagar and Jerusalem Sarah? True, Paul does call Sarah Jerusalem, but he has the spiritual and heavenly Jerusalem in mind, not the earthly Jerusalem. Sarah represents that spiritual Jerusalem where there is no law, but only the promise, and where the inhabitants are free. To show that the law has been quite abolished, the earthly Jerusalem was completely destroyed with all her ornaments, temples, and ceremonies.